Nice to be with everyone. We'll get started in just uh, a moment. I'll let a few more folks arrive and then I'll put up in the chat the refuges and pre precepts that we can of our program. And I'm assuming everybody can hear me okay. Maybe some thumbs up. Oh, good. And maybe as we're getting settled, some people will listen uh, to the live stream that we put up on our YouTube channel at another time. People, for example, we have a few people in Europe who are taking the class and of course it's quite late now and they may want to have small groups. So when you're listening to this, all of you who are in, a, in the sort of European time zones and um, you, we can help you create small groups. So send me an email if the small groups that we organize at the end of week two tonight, week four and week six don't work for you. Send me an email and uh, Gabe Keller Flores and I will try to create uh, an online small group for people who'd like to talk about their practice at another time. So there we go. I've just pasted in the chat the uh, refuges and precepts. This is how we begin our Buddhist studies classes, as most of you know. So feel free to read along or chant along with me. And then we'll do a guided meditation after this. Udang Saranang Achami Damang Saranang Achami Sangang Saranang Gachami Dutiampi Pudang Saranang Gachami Dutiampi Damang Saranang Kachami Dutiampi Sangang Saranang Kachami Tatiampi Pudang Saranang Kachami Tatiampi Damang Saranang Kachami Tatiampi Sangang Saranang Kachami. And settling into a comfortable posture when you're ready.
I thought I'd begin tonight reading this uh, sutta, this discourse from the Buddha. Just as many diverse winds blow back and forth across the sky, easterly winds and westerly winds, northerly winds and southerly winds, dusty winds and dustless winds, sometimes cold, sometimes hot, those that are strong and others mild, winds of many kinds that blow. So in this very body here, various kinds of feelings arise, pleasant ones, painful ones, and those that are neutral. But when one diligently does not neglect clear comprehension, then that wise one fully understands feelings in their entirety. Having fully understood feelings, one is influx free in this very life. Standing in Dhamma with the body's breakup, such a wise one cannot be reckoned. And there's other places and other times teachers use this image of weather, the weather of our feeling, the feeling tone. Sometimes the weather, the quality of our experience is pleasant, sometimes not pleasant, sometimes neutral in the same way that sometimes the weather is the way we like it. Sometimes the weather is the way we don't like it. And a lot of the time it's just so-so, not especially pleasant and not especially unpleasant. And we, when we're wise at least, we don't get upset about the weather because we know this is how it is now, and it will change. It's not going to be this snowy day in our case right now. It's not going to be snowy forever. So let's take the time and settle into the weather system of our body right now. As best you can cultivating a relatively still and relaxed posture and in an easy way cultivating a sincere interest, curiosity, alertness to the great swirling weather system of sensation in the body. Whatever today's weather in the body feels like, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. But even before tuning into the feeling tone, as we're just sitting here aware of the body, aware of sensation, Let's take some time and we'll contemplate contact, sense contact, how in each moment there are many, many arisings of sense experience in the body. The sensitive heart, the sensitive mind is in a very real way touched or impinged upon by the coming and going of sensation. So we're just gonna sit in a relaxed way and acknowledge this exposure. The sensitive mind, the sensitive heart, right now, right here, is exposed there's this incessant 
contact. Sense experience, sensation is coming and going rapidly. A lot of those sensations coming and going, of course, are relatively neutral. They don't stand out. But there's probably some unpleasant sensations and pinging on the sensitive heart and perhaps even some pleasant sensations. So as best you can, just attune to the exposure of sensation, the exposure to sensation. And it's incessant, never ending touching of the heart. And although we can distract ourselves, there's really no ending to this exposure. So this can be in some ways activating to get interested in this incessant exposure to sensation. So we want to keep reminding the heart to relax. Is it safe to relax? Is it okay to trust this exposure? And with the Buddha's teachings on feeling tone, Vedana, he's asking us to do this relatively subtle work of noticing what arises right with contact. So in this case, we're interested in this exposure to sensation, physical sensation this incessant ongoing touching. Sensations are making contact with the sensitivity of the heart. And right with this contact, there's a momentary recognition or perception. And even if there's a sensations that we've never had before, it will be recognized as a sensation that's unfamiliar. And right with the contact and the perception, the recognition is feeling tone. Now don't get tight about how the Buddha is asking us to discern this ordinary experience of being aware of sensation. And it's often best to start with sensation or contact that is clearly pleasant or unpleasant. Just get interested in that experience, especially if it's a repeating sensation. So for example, if you're pleasantly full and you had a nice meal a little bit ago, then you might just attune to the pleasantness of being full, having had a good meal. And there's the sensation, the contact, and the recognition of being full and the pleasantness of it. They're not necessarily something we can separate out, just more like different facets of the same experience.
or the belt might be too tight. So there's the contact, that pressure along the waist and the recognition, tightness. There's tightness in my, along my belly and the clear sense of it being unpleasant. And of course, if we're not careful, then often a reaction will arise. If there's pleasantness, the reaction will be greed, wanting to hold on, make more of it, have more of it. If it's unpleasant, there'll be aversion and wanting to fix it or get rid of it. But when there's the stability of awareness and some wisdom, then we can be aware of the feeling tone with equanimity. Oh, it's just pleasantness being known. And we're more likely to notice how the feeling tone changes. And I'm sure many of you notice this in your own study, how we're being aware of feeling tone with wisdom or without wisdom affects the feeling tone. And so for this guided meditation, we want to, and you can even experiment, we want to get clear first that there is feeling tone and that it matters how we relate, how the mind relates to feeling tone. So for example, if there is some unpleasantness, exposure to unpleasant sensation in the body now, then see if you can allow that normal ordinary impulse toward aversion to arise. There's contact, there's some recognition. I don't like this, this tightness at my belly, it's unpleasant. Will anybody notice if I loosen my belt? So we'll notice that aversive reaction, whether it's acted on or not, wanting it to go away, getting frustrated. And then shift, invite in wisdom. Well, what is it really here? Oh yeah, there's this unpleasantness. Well, can I be intimate, actually interested in the unpleasantness of this tightness of the belt on the belly? So we bring, we invite wisdom awareness to get close. Instead of taking the well-worn pathway towards reactivity, we experiment with just getting really close to the unpleasantness. And seeing the underlying nature of feeling town, that it is also something that comes and goes like weather like the winds.
part of the delusion that comes with our habit energies around feeling tone is that the particular feeling tone we're feeling somehow defines us or will always be with us. So when we're hurting, it seems like this is going to be the way it is forever. Or if things are really nice, pleasant, that there's some way I could hold on and make this last forever. And it's this wrong understanding that leads the mind down that pathway towards greed and aversion. And it's wisdom that understands that feeling, the feeling tone will change on its own. It's never been very substantial or fixed or constant. It's never actually been the problem we thought it was. But that underlying truth of feeling tone is only revealed when the mind is really interested with wisdom and that stability of present moment awareness. So we're going to continue in silence for the next 10 minutes, but you can explore the other sense gates. We've been using the sense gate of sensation, but there's also seeing and hearing and smelling and tasting maybe to some degree. And there's also the activity of the mind, thoughts and emotions, and to be interested in the pleasantness and neutrality and unpleasantness. And you might start with just sensing the exposure to each of these six sense gates or whichever ones you're interested in. Really get a sense of the incessant contact and how the mind naturally recognizes and in a sense assigns a feeling tone for each sense experience. All that happens automatically. We don't do that. It just happens because of the way the mind is conditioned. And just explore how to relate skillfully to the exposure of sense experience. So let's continue in silence now.
And of course, if you're getting tight, then you're probably trying too hard. Whatever it is that Vedana or feeling tone is, it's here and now already. So we don't need a different experience, a different exposure to sense contact, sense experience. Sometimes the, the easy way to get a sense of feeling tone is to notice the reaction of aversion or the reaction of greed and then trace back to the experience that's triggering the greed or the aversion. What's the feeling here? Is this pleasant? How does the mind know that this is pleasant? How does the mind know that this experience is unpleasant? What is it here and now? Can I get close to this recognition of pleasantness, unpleasantness? Can I relax, allow it to be? In our study of feeling tone, we really get to observe how the view in the mind can change and we can become what the Buddha would call a worldly person, an ignorant person. And that means we are struggling with the feeling tone Pleasantness immediately leading to liking and greed. Unpleasantness immediately leading to not liking and aversion. And neutrality or something that's not clearly pleasant or unpleasant leading to ignoring the experience, dismissing it. So we can see how in one moment we'll be relating with ignorance and reacting to the feeling tone. And then in the next moment, wisdom arises and we understand the feeling tone very clearly, sensitively, relaxed, allowing the conditions, the feeling tone to be what it is that the moment then is characterized by equanimity and balance. And there's no problem or less of a problem. And then we can swing right back to reactivity and there definitely seems to be a problem. And back and forth like that. And this really helps to deepen our understanding of what the path is all about. how natural it is for the mind to be reactive because of habit and how there's a possibility of non-reactivity, just letting nature be nature, being intimate and relaxed.
So take a moment, adjust the body. Really nice to be with everybody this evening. I'm very grateful that we can show up together in this way. It's really a great boon for all of us, I think, that we can have the space and time to get to know our mind. <laughs> I often mention in the uh, introduction class that I teach on Tuesday nights a couple times a year that the most amazing thing is we have this thing we call the mind or the heart and just how uninquisitive we've been. You know, we've been just too busy to take some time to get to know the mind, even though clearly it's the most relevant thing about being a human being and living skillfully, but it just doesn't seem like there's time or the right time to use the heart and mind to get to know the heart and mind. And that's really what we're doing together. And as you all know, in this particular course, we're using this particular frame. And that's really what these maps or these teachings from the Buddha are. He gives us a teaching a, through language. So it's a concept. And we use that concept like, hey, everyone, get interested in feeling tone, right? And so then we have this frame, we have that idea, oh, there's something called feeling tone. And we have all the ideas that are about that, all the instructions. And then that we use those ideas to create a frame, which we then helps illuminate our experience, helps to see, feel, know what's always been here, but we haven't had a way to get interested in it. And the, um, you know, the teachings really help us direct our attention, this balanced, non-judging, curious attention to this thing we call feeling tone. And we say um, that feeling tone arises because of contact. And what do we know about contact? It's happening all the time. I mean, amazingly quickly because it's coming in through the six sense doors that I talked about last week briefly, right? The five physical senses, the body mind is sensitive in these five ways, right? Um, through touch and through sight and hearing and smell and taste. And we're also sensitive to mental activity and the sensitivity of the heart is constantly impinged upon by these six things. Thanks, Barbara, maybe I'll move this down. So we have contact and then right with contact, we say that what arises in conjunction with contact is the mind, you know, this part of the mind, the cognizing part of the mind, it will recognize the experience and that recognition or that perception is going to be based on the past. So when I see a site like the, a school bus on the street, that momentary, that moment of seeing, that's the contact. And then immediately there's recognition, that's a bus. And that moment where the mind names it or recognize it, recognizes it as a bus, that is based on all the past experiences I've had with similarly looking objects, right? And then right with that perception, that recognition, you know, like if I had a traumatic experience with a bus when I was a kid, then the unpleasantness will probably arise. Or if I have really sweet memories with buses, then it will be a pleasant, or maybe it's neutral, not obviously pleasant or unpleasant. But that all happens together very quickly, right? So don't imagine that we're somehow going to separate out the contact from the perception from the feeling tone. And as I mentioned in the guided sit, sometimes like if it was a stronger experience, we're already in the reaction. And then, but we can kind of trace back and sense, oh yeah, that's what the mind saw. 
That was the contact that just shape, color, whatever. That was the recognition. That was the feeling tone. And the idea is, you know, to learn how to see things just as they are. So when we get this breakdown, this is one of the teachings of five aggregates where the Buddha is basically helping us understand the mind by breaking it into these four things, perception or recognition, feeling tone. Mental formation is all of that reactivity if we're not so wise in the moment, like if we've had trauma with school buses to turn away or to run away or whatever we might do to curse at it, all of that intentionality that comes up when we have sense contact, that's mental formations and consciousness is what illuminates it all. So these are just four things that happen in our experience, the sort of different facets of what we call the mind or we call the knowing mind perception feeling tone mental formations that's a kind of a catch-all category and consciousness and so when we get this teaching that there is something called feeling tone well you see it it, it really supports interest or curiosity as we're looking at a moment of sense contact and then we see that there's a choice, like how we relate, how the mind is relating to feeling tone. Is feeling tone triggering the kind of usual suspects of greed, hatred, and delusion, right? So pleasant experience triggers greed, unpleasant experience triggers hatred or aversion, and neutral experience triggers um, ignorance or ignoring. Uh, somebody sent in a question about this uh, today. I'll just read the question. I was reading some of the articles you sent out and I'm surprised to read that delusion is the word used to describe neutral experience. Well, it's, it's the word, delusion is the word used to describe how an untrained mind relates to neutral experience, right? Because the untrained mind, when we're not, when our practice doesn't have momentum, which is a lot of the time during the day, we are, the mind remains unaware. It ignores, it's ignorant of neutral experience. Like right now, you know, like if we, if we are invited to be more mindful with our eyes open, the ears hearing, the body feeling, we can begin to sense how amazingly rich this moment is, just the visual experience alone. But you know, like now for a lot of us, except for the sound of my voice, the auditory experience might be pretty neutral, but we can be interested in that. Like the sensitive heart is being touched by all kinds of sounds and the sensitive eyes are being touched by all kinds of sights and the sensitive skin, all kinds of touches, even smells, although pretty neutral maybe for most of us. Taste maybe relatively neutral for most, most of the taste. And then the mental activity Some of you know that, uh, well, let me just continue reading this before I forget. Um, for all my years coming to Common Ground, I never made that connection, this person writes. I've always thought delusion was the stories we tell ourselves when we can't accept or see the facts to explain something that's happening to us in order to avoid reality. Can you please shed some light on how this word is connected to neutral experience? The one thing I wonder is if it's about being zoned out or not connecting to the present moment. Yeah, I think that's the point there. Leading us to say there's nothing going on here when in fact, there's always something going on. Yeah, and, and neutrality, there's a lot for us to learn about neutrality because when there's 
interest in neutrality. You know, we often use something neutral as a meditation object, like breathing in, breathing out. It's relatively speaking a neutral experience or feeling the whole body sitting. Maybe not later when the body starts to ache, but often, you know, in the beginning, it's a relatively neutral experience being aware of the body sitting. And when we are aware with interest, then we see the possibility of equanimity and balance. Because greed and aversion aren't getting triggered, and we've trained ourselves not to ignore, to be ignorant of neutrality, but to be interested in it, even vividly interested in it, and continuously interested in it, like we do with the mindfulness of breathing, then we really see that how natural equanimity and balance can be because we're really vividly aware of something neutral. So the affective tone of the awareness is equanimous, it's balanced because there's neither greed nor aversion being triggered. And we learn something about, oh, maybe this is the way, this way of being balance this way of non-aversion and non-greed. So there's all kinds of things we learn by getting to know a neutral experience. But the big obstacle, as this person is pointing to, is delusion or ignorance. Because there's, uh, and I'll read the, the second arrow sutta that I sent in one of the links I sent out where the Buddha really talks about how it is that this ignorance or this delusion around neutral experience comes to be. Maybe I'll just go to that right now so that we make sure to cover it. So I sent out um, the sutta translated by Tanisaro Bhikkhu, a well-known um, teacher and translator, uh, a Western Buddhist monk who's the abbot of a monastery outside of uh, San Diego in California. Sometimes it's translated as the second arrow or the second dart. And it's one of the more famous discourses. And it's all about um, how we use our understanding of Vedana, feeling tone, to liberate the heart. So I'm going to read a slightly different translation than the one I sent out. Practitioners, ordinary people experience pleasant Vedana, pleasant feeling, painful Vedana, neutral Vedana. Well-instructed students also experience pleasant, painful, and neutral feeling tone. So what's the difference? What's the distinction? What distinguishing factor is there between well-instructed students of the Buddha, you know, students, practitioners with some insight and ordinary people. <laughs> this is a not, not an uncommon setup for these teachings. Like, what do you get when you do your practice well? And what happens if you don't do your practice well, right? And so, uh, <clears throat> The, the students, the monks that are there, say the Buddha asked them, like, what's the distinction? And the monks say, we don't want to answer. We want you to answer your question. <laughs> so the Buddha, out of compassion, decided he would answer the question. So he says to them, when touched with a painful feeling tone, ordinary people then also experience sorrow, grief, lamentation. They beat their chests and they become distraught. Right, so that's the second arrow, right? So first they have a painful, let's say, physical sensation, and then they hate, right? They, they don't like it. So that because of the unpleasantness, they immediately go into aversion. And aversion is a painful emotional state. So that's the second arrow. Just as if a person was shot with an arrow and right afterward they were shot with another one so that they would feel the pain of two arrows. In the same way, when touched with painful Vedana, painful feeling tone, ordinary people sorrow, grieve, lament, beat their chest, 
and become distraught. So they feel two pains, physical and mental. So that's what the Buddha means by an ordinary or sometimes that gets translated as a worldly person, somebody who hasn't yet trained their mind, hasn't yet developed wisdom. And we're that person a lot of the time where we experience pain and we react to the unpleasantness of that pain in ways that add more pain. Anybody done that today? Right? We do that a lot where we get tight around the unpleasantness we run into and we react and we add more pain to our experience. This happens regularly, whether the initial arrow, arrow is physical pain or emotional pain, whatever it might be, or disturbing sound. You know, how many times have we been in a room with an irritating sound and we got all whipped up, frustrated? And who's to say whether the pain of the frustration wasn't greater than the unpleasantness of the sound? A lot of times, the unpleasantness of our reaction is many times more unpleasant than the initial unpleasant experience. So the Buddha goes on. As they are touched by painful feeling tone, they become resistant. We become resistant. Now this should be familiar to all of us. Then, and they who resist painful feeling tone, an underlying tendency, right, becomes the habit, an underlying tendency of resistance against painful feeling tone comes to underline, underlie their mind. It's our habit to be averse, right? That's what he's saying. Touched by painful Vedana, they yearn for sensual pleasure. Why? Why do we want something pleasant when we have a lot of pain? The Buddha says, because it's the only way we know how to uh, escape those two arrows of the pain and the second arrow of not liking the pain and getting tight about having pain. The only way we know to get some escape, some freedom, is to seek out something pleasant. So he says, because that ordinary person does not know any escape from painful feeling tone aside from sensual pleasure, then in those who seek sensual pleasure, an underlying tendency to lust, to greed for pleasant feeling tone comes to underline their mind. So the reason we have this skewed a tendency to get greedy around what's pleasant is we've been using pleasantness to give us some space from all the unpleasantness. And because of that, we've developed a neurotic relationship to pleasant. Have you noticed, like when our day is not going well, what do we want? Chocolate, caffeine, something funny on the, you know, on the internet or whatever, gossip with a friend, right? So we go, we, and we get overly dependent because we want that piece of chocolate to save us from the unpleasantness that we're experiencing in our life. We don't know a better way. And it doesn't end there. So the Buddha is really setting up in this discourse, how we, get neurotic about feeling tone. We don't know what to do with the pain, so we resist it. That resistance becomes an underlying habit. It's the second arrow. Now we have more pain because we have the difficulty in life, and then we have the resistance to the difficulty in life, and we're feeling overwhelmed. We're looking for an out. We crave something pleasant. And so then we have this skewed neurotic relationship to pleasant, right? Which is stressful. And because of that obsession with something pleasant to modify the pain we're feeling, we skew our relationship to, ne to neutrality. That's what he says next in this discourse. We start to ignore things that are neutral because we're desperate for pleasant things to modify to give us some space from the unpleasantness that we're feeling because we're resisting unpleasantness. 
there's an ordinary un unpleasant experience. And then there's our neurotic resistance, even though the unpleasantness is here, it, somehow it seems to make sense to get tight and to not like it, which just adds to the pain. And that's what he calls, the Buddha calls an ordinary human being. Someone who has an underlying tendency to resist pain, an underlying tendency to seek out pleasure, to take care of the pain, and an underlying tendency to ignore what's neutral. Because it, if I attended to, if I was intimate with what's neutral, I'd have to stop my incessant neurotic search for pleasantness to modify the pain. And so then he ends this by saying, um, when they experience pleasant, painful, or neutral feeling tone, they feel it as one fettered by it, you know, weighed down by it, burdened by it. Such a one practitioners is called an ordinary person who is fettered by birth, by old age, by death, by sorrow, lamentation, grief, pain, despair. They are fettered. This I declare. And so this is the oppressiveness of ordinary life because we haven't learned what to do with feeling tone. And so we have these habits, we keep following these habits. And when our habits don't work, we try harder with the same basic habit, same approach. Okay, so th seeking out that sense pleasure didn't really modify my pain. Well, let me look in the fridge. That didn't work. Let me look online. Now, well-instructed practitioners, right? So now he's talking about not the ordinary worldly folks, but the people who have done their practice. When touched, when these wise folks are touched with a painful Vedana, painful feeling tone, they do not sorrow, grieve, or lament. They don't beat their chests. They don't become distraught. So they feel one pain, right? Whatever that initial pain was, whether it was physical, emotional, but they don't have the pain of the mental reactivity. Just as if a person was shot with an arrow and right afterward, they were not to shoot another one, <laughs> right? Because why get tight? If something, if we bang our head on a kitchen cabinet and it really hurts, you know, what's useful to do in that moment? Get really tight or get really angry at ourselves for being so stupid? Does that help? But we don't know what to do with the pain in our forehead having banged the head. But what can we do that we forget to do? we can be intimate with that unpleasant, maybe even extremely unpleasant feeling tone. Especially in the first few seconds, you know, when you stub your toe, when you bang your head, when you cut your hand, you know, initially the feeling tone for the first second or two can be very unpleasant. And then what happens? It's not so unpleasant. But we don't want that momentary exposure to unpleasantness. So what do we do? We, in one way or another, we get tight, we resist. It's a deep habit to resist painful sensation, unpleasantness, isn't it? We think it seems rational, we don't think about it, but just the force of habit is to get tight, to shoot the second arrow. And it doesn't make anything doesn't take away from the initial painful experience. And then we still want to protect ourselves. We want to do something. So we seek out something pleasant and reinforce that ignorance around pleasantness, which is it's going to save me. Isn't that true? We think pleasant experience like it's that promise that's never kept. If only I get that perfect massage, or if only I have that sweet treat that I really like, 
or if only I get to spend time with the person I want to spend time with. It's really nice, like as we're looking at unpleasant, pleasant and neutral these weeks to kind of look at that, your relationship to pleasantness as a savior <laughs> and all the little and big ways that we do that. All of us do that, right? And you're going to, even when real deep, let's say your practice progresses and you're, you just feel like you're wiser than you used to be 10 years ago, you'll still feel that inclination. And there's no reason um, to say, oh, honey, you don't get any pleasant experience. You can give yourself a treat. You can put a sweater on when you're cold. You can do nice things that are pleasant because it, it creates a really good place to study like how, what pleasantness is. It isn't a savior. You know, when we eat chocolate, it doesn't save us. It's pleasant, like if you're assuming you like it, it's pleasant. And then very quickly, it's not much of anything. How long does the pleasantness last? It's pretty ephemeral and it's really good. So instead of thinking, oh, I, I can't use any pleasantness. No, use it, but just study it as a mindfulness object. Okay, what is it? Here's the inclination, you know, to do this as a way to, you know, you've had a busy, stressful day, you get home and we sort of, I don't know if you're like me, but we line up some pleasant things. Okay, I get to listen to the news, that's pleasant mostly, you know, I get to make lunch, I really like that, that's, you know, I get to lie down, take my nap, I get, you know, to hang out with the cat, say hello to the cat. So we kind of line these things up and it's almost like a deal with the devil, like, okay, life is stressful, but I'm going to balance it out with these pleasant things. And when they stop working, then I'll look for other pleasant things. Maybe I'll go shopping, get excited about that. But it's all a bad deal with the devil being pushed around by feeling tone is stressful. So the Buddha says, just as if a person were shot with an arrow and right afterward, were, they were not to shoot another one so that they would feel the pain of only one arrow, right? So that means we're willing to be exposed to the pleasantness, unpleasantness and neutrality that come our way. We're not afraid of it. Having been touched by painful feeling tone, they do not resist it. Hence in them, these are the wise ones now, and them no underlying tendency of resistance against painful Vedana comes to underline their mind. Under the impact of painful Vedana, they do not yearn for sensual happiness, right? So we're, we're feeling, you know, the symptoms of a flu, unpleasant, but we know how to be with the unpleasantness. And because we have this strategy of just being intimate with the unpleasantness and seeing it for what it is, something that's ephemeral, it's real, but it's changing. It's not definitively me, this pain. It's uh, like the winds or the weather that showed up. It's like this now. And at some point it will be like something else, maybe pleasant, maybe neutral. So we have this strategy of being with it. So then we, the Buddha says, we're not developing a skewed relationship uh, for sensual happiness. So then my relationship to the pleasures of life is in balance because I'm not expecting the pleasure in life to save me from pain because I know how to be with pain. So then I have a more honest, healthy, balanced relationship to pleasure. I'm not ignoring pleasure and I'm not avoiding it. And when pleasure is around, I happily receive it. And what do I know? This is pleasant. It's really pleasant. It's really nice. It's like this now, but I'm not, I'm not relating to it as if it's going to be here to save me. It's just a pleasant experience being known. And because I have this balanced relationship with pleasure and pain, I'm not ignoring the neutral. And so we have a much more full experience in life because, you know, as I'm sure many of you are discovering, 
a lot of life is neutral. This is another question that came in. Really appreciate the questions. You're always welcome to send them in. And you're also welcome to bring them to the weekly practice check-in. So when Fricky and I, my spouse and the co-founder of Common Ground, we do it at 4.30 on Sunday afternoons, a really generally small group uh, guided sit and then just a, a beautiful discussion. And then Stacy McClendon and I do it on Tuesday at 12 noon. So those are both good times um, to bring your questions or you can email them in. And then if I can, I'll use them in the class. So before we break into small groups tonight, let me just address this other question that came in. And it, I really appreciate this person reflecting in their writing, just what they've been learning. It's really beautiful to read. So this person wrote, in the beginning, when I tried to categorize my physical sensations, I almost felt like I needed to be psychic to see how those sensations were making me feel besides the sensations itself. Because most of the time, my mind was quite neutral toward the sensations. So it was making me search for a specific feeling that I was supposed to be feeling within myself. So I found that hard to do. And a lot of the times, like when we're in that place where we're being attentive, there might be already a lot of stability of awareness and wisdom there. And you probably have noticed that when there's a lot of stability of awareness and wisdom, experience goes towards neutrality, doesn't it? Because the way the mind is relating is wholesome. So that way of relating to pain, the way of relating dominates the experience. Because there's always two things that make up an experience. There's the thing we're seeing or the sensation we're feeling or the sound we're hearing or the thought we're thinking. And then there's the way the mind is relating to that experience. And together that makes the experience. So if the mind is relating with a lot of wholesomeness, a lot of clarity, a lot of patience, a lot of acceptance, a lot of curiosity, a lot of balance, even if that mind is knowing painful sensation in the body, there probably won't be a lot of the painful feeling tone because there's also the pleasantness of relating skillfully, right? The calm, the stability, those are pleasant sensations, but it's the pleasantness of the skillful way of relating or the skillful way of knowing. So this is a thing, our experience in any moment is complex. There's so many different things coming and going, touching and pinging on the sensitive heart. And then there's the presence or absence of wisdom or the presence or absence of kindness. And that all matters in terms of like what feeling tone will be present in any moment. And I'll just read a little bit more. Then after I read the resources that you shared, the articles, uh, sounded like sensations just itself needed to categorize if it is pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral for sterile. And seems like they all have a distinct flavor. For example, pain is unpleasant, which is very easy to notice and categorize as unpleasant, according to my own experience. The most of the sensations or sensory experiences seem neutral as you mentioned before. And pleasant experience almost rarely happens unless I eat strawberry. <laughs> yeah, and then I kind of covered with this person went on to write. And it's, and it's useful to notice the pleasant experiences or the pleasant uh, feeling tone that's there when there is the stability of present moment awareness that inner sense of calm, that inner sense of interest, the lightness of joy, the calm of tranquility, the stillness of concentration, the balance of equanimity, right? So there's a lot of pleasantness that arises when wisdom, you know, what we call wise awareness, when the practice is in balance and has some momentum. And we want to acknowledge that. 
So for those of you who can stay for the small group, um, or if you can't for whatever reason, you're, it's really late where you are, um, then try to find a Dharma friend to talk about feeling tone and what you're learning and what happens when you look for feeling tone like this person just shared. Um, let me just think of other questions here that you might seem relevant when you're meeting in your groups of three or four. Um, how do you, how do feelings arise? Like really explore that contact, recognition, feeling tone. How do you see feeling tone showing up in your experience? Do you have any control over it? Like noticing the talk about the impersonal nature of feeling tone. When you have negative or I'm sorry, unpleasant feeling tone, that's not personal. You didn't, it's not a personal failure that there's a lot of pain being known because it's a, the painfulness or the unpleasantness rather, it's arising because of how the mind has been conditioned in the past. There's really nothing we can do. How have you learned to have more freedom around feeling tone? That would be great to share. And really appreciative of Michelle uh, who's going to help divide you into small groups. I'm going to make you host Michelle so that you can be empowered to do that. And just a couple announcements. Um, I'm going to be leading a day long retreat on Saturday, the 27th of March. And the instructions for that day long will be on feeling tone. So if you're free that Saturday, 930 to four on Saturday, central time, of course, the 27th, then join in. And even if you can only be there for half the day, especially if you've been on retreats before, that's acceptable um, for people who have experience with previous retreats to just come for the first half or the second half and leave at lunch or come at lunch time. But you can sign up for that online. And of course, many other programs coming up. So wishing everyone who stays a really good conversation. Hope to see you next Monday night. Have a good week, everyone.